Hello, and welcome to Green Tea with D-Man, episode 1.8, Antonio Salazar, The Gathering Storm. Last episode, we talked about the Spanish Civil War and Portugal's role and involvement in the conflict. Well, today, we're going to cover the same time period of 1936 to 1939, but with a focus on Portugal's actions leading up to, and then at the beginning of, the conflict we all know, the Second World War. In 1936, as tension grew and the Spanish Civil War kicked off, it was becoming clear to many leaders in Europe that a continental conflict was fast approaching. Germany, Italy, France, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and many other states increased military production, and Salazar was well aware of Portugal's own shortfalls in weapons, aircraft, and naval vessels. With Portugal lacking an industrial base, there was no way for the country to manufacture the weapons and equipment that it needed to field a strong army, navy, and air force. The other major limitation during the early and mid-1930s, aside from weak industry, was that Salazar wasn't a fan of Portugal taking on debt. So in order to upgrade the armed forces, Portugal had to take baby steps under Salazar, much to the frustration of army officers in the regime. One of the major elements of Salazarism during the 1930s was an effort to reform the armed forces, primarily to get the army officers who had been around since the 1926 coup back to the barracks and out of state affairs. Unfortunately, the issues which had plagued Portuguese society and state institutions for decades, namely being corruption, had also dug itself deep into the cadre of army and naval officers. One of the major victories for Salazar in reforming the armed forces came in May 1936, when he took over as war minister and appointed Captain Fernando Santos Costa as his undersecretary for war. Captain Santos Costa represented the army's technocrats, and he proved to be loyal to Salazar for the next 25 years, while absorbing much of the criticisms and frustrations leveled by the old guard of the army officer corps. We spoke before about the Portuguese ships, the Dow and the Albuquerque, and how they were brand new ships when communist and anarchist crew members mutinied while in port in Lisbon. These ships were part of Salazar's efforts to modernize the navy, a navy which had been so neglected through the years that its officers were primarily a land-obsessed bureaucracy, more intent to gobble up estates for themselves than actually providing leadership to and conducting training for the new fleet. The army watched the modernizing of the fleet with resentment, as the Portuguese army lacked everything from field artillery to motorized vehicles to tanks. In a bid to address these shortfalls, Salazar waited until he first tackled the old guard of the army and guided the promotion of the younger officers to leadership, where he could trust them in building a new army. Once this was done, Salazar reached out to Portugal's old ally, the United Kingdom, for new weapons and equipment. The British were leery of providing equipment to Portugal, mostly because they were so far behind the Germans in production and updated weaponry, and also because there were other nations in Europe which were higher on the pecking order for receiving British equipment ahead of Portugal. The British attitude of Portugal, being a tiny partner, took the cards, and it was reinforced by the belief in London that the Portuguese were not serious about their own rearmament. Portugal had yet to draw up a comprehensive military reform and rearmament plan, and the British needed to see Portugal as actually serving some role of importance for the British in the event that war broke out. Armindo Monteiro, Portugal's foreign minister, who then went on to become the ambassador for Portugal to the United Kingdom, wrote to Salazar in March 1937 regarding British attitudes towards Portuguese requests for military hardware. There are some means of convincing England of the advantages she might derive from our military preparation. I think that a patient campaign is necessary, one that can bring her to our terrain, making her work with us. If we continue our rearmament alongside the military, education of the army, and the people, the English will eventually accept the facts. They will then prefer to make us their friends, helping us. But they stand before us as Dr. Salazar stands before his ministers, Seeing is believing. The English do not yet believe in us. During 1936 to 1937, 
there was a deep sense of mistrust by the United Kingdom and other nations that any supply of armaments to Portugal would almost certainly end up in the hands of nationalist forces in Spain. One such country who felt this way was Czechoslovakia. Portugal and the Czechs had been working on a deal for machine guns when the Spanish Civil War blew up, and being one of the only remaining democracies left in Europe by 1936, Czechoslovakia immediately sided with the Republican government in Spain. As negotiations continued on the arms deal, Czechoslovakia decided to include a clause in the agreement stating that Portugal would promise not to allow the machine guns to make it into the hands of Spanish rebels. Salazar found this requirement deeply offensive, and he was informed by Italian and Portuguese agents in Prague that Soviet influence and pressure from Republican Spain's minister in Czechoslovakia had led to the requirement. Eventually, this issue escalated to the point Salazar cut ties with the Czech government, just in time to feel no ill will when Hitler gobbled up the Sudetenland and then the rest of the Czech region. The British mistrusted Portuguese motives, especially after seeing how friendly it had become with the Germans and Italians, not to mention how German businessmen were setting up shop in Lisbon at an increasing rate, both in terms of numbers and influence. This was doubled by the attitude of the British Foreign Office, which did not take serious Portuguese desires to modernize its armed forces, and it really didn't care. What the British wanted most was to use Portugal almost as a type of protectorate, and this opinion was reinforced when in January 1938, the British military mission to Portugal laid out its desires on the program with Lisbon to include measures for improving British facilities for joint defense, measures for improving Portuguese coastal defenses so that, in case of war, Portugal could provide facilities for the British fleet, and also air bases on land, the collaboration between the industries of the two countries in supplying munitions to one another, and lastly, the comparison of the organization and equipment of the two armies. Montero and Salazar were deeply disappointed by the British military mission's lack of serious commitment to Portuguese defense in the event of war, but it should be noted that during this time, the British were suffering from major weaknesses in regards to its ground forces, lack of preparation for any meaningful conflict, and was devoting most of its energy towards staving off another European, let alone global, war. As a result of the British failing to meet his needs, Salazar decided to acquiesce to some of Germany's prime deals for supplying armaments to the Portuguese military. This included, in December 1936, the delivery of 10 brand new Yonkers Ju-52 bombers. Where Britain could only muster rusty leftovers from World War I, the Germans and Italians were offering Portugal fresh inventory, which matched the inventory of the Wehrmacht and the Luftwaffe. Not even a year later in 1937, the Germans would deliver 10 of the new and more powerful Ju-86 bombers, while the Italians also provided 10 of their latest ground attack aircraft, the Breda 65. In addition to aircraft, the Germans were providing Portugal with generous financial terms, as well as training and technical assistance. To sweeten the deal in July of 1938, the Germans inked a deal with Portugal to allow production of the Mauser bolt-action rifle in Portugal. The Germans had hoped that providing Portugal with some of its best equipment and giving them such generous terms that the Portuguese state would throw its lot in with the Axis, but Salazar kept true to the old Anglo-Portuguese alliance, and during 1936 to 1938, when the British held off on Portuguese requests for rearmament, Salazar worked out as many small deals as he could to show the British that he was serious. Eventually, the British came around to Salazar's point and decided to send a military mission to Portugal in 1938. This mission met little success at first, but it provided Salazar the opportunity to unveil a comprehensive military strategy along with Captain Santos Costa, and to continue hammering home his point that a Spain under Franco could be brought into a friendly pact with Portugal, which would help keep Iberia free from the Nazis in the event of war. After two years of refusing to aid in rearming Portugal, the British finally agreed in March 1938 that the Portuguese military should use the same weapons, and the British government agreed to help the Portuguese in placing her orders for armaments from British firms. However, and much to Salazar's dismay, the British would have final say on delivery dates for these orders. Portuguese worries were slightly alleviated when Her Majesty's government agreed to provide adequate defensive measures, 
until arms shipments were well underway and the Portuguese military was in better shape. On the diplomatic front during the years leading up to the Second World War, the Portuguese were in overdrive as we stated in the last episode. Salazar took over as foreign minister in 1937, and he decided to concentrate all foreign policy decision-making in his hands, which served Portugal well during the war years, but it did create its own issues. As we mentioned before, Salazar was charting a pro-Portuguese foreign policy, which made the average Portuguese citizen very proud. However, it sort of put Portugal in between a rock and a hard place. That rock was the United Kingdom, and the hard place was Nazi Germany. In a few minutes, we will talk about Portuguese diplomatic efforts with Nazi Germany and other countries leading up to September 1939. But first, I want to talk about Africa. Why Africa? Well, during Neville Chamberlain's time of appeasing Hitler, there was a lot of chatter about the British offering Portuguese and Belgian colonial possessions to the Germans in order to make up for the loss of Tanganyika in World War I and to hopefully keep Hitler from taking territory in Europe. Portuguese possessions in Africa had long been a point of contention between the Portuguese and other European powers, especially the British and Germans. We already mentioned the 1890 ultimatum in an earlier episode, but Anglo-German agreements in 1898 and 1899 carved up Portuguese Africa for English and German possession in the event Portugal's government collapsed. In the First World War, when Portugal egged the Germans into declaring war, German General Paul von Lettel Vorbeck led a spectacular guerrilla campaign against the Allies, including the defeat of Portuguese forces and then the ransacking of Mozambique. Despite outnumbering the Germans, the Portuguese were forced to chase their tail as German and Ascari forces all but occupied Mozambique from 1917 into 1918. As an aside, I highly recommend the book by Robert Gowdy titled African Kaiser, General Paul von Leto Volbeck and the Great War in Africa. The book is absolutely fantastic, 10 out of 10 stars, and extremely entertaining. Anyways, fast forward to November 1937, and rumors popped up that Lord Halifax, upon visiting Berlin, had discussed appeasing the German government with an offer of Portuguese territory in Angola and Mozambique. Ministers on both sides, to include Anthony Eden and Hermann Goring, denied this was ever discussed between the two nations, but Salazar was still uneasy. As a result, Armindo Monteiro made some suggestions to Salazar in addressing the colonies in Africa. First, to oppose any agreement modifying the present division of power in Africa. Secondly, to prove to the British and French that any alteration to the status quo would undermine British and French interests. Thirdly, Monteiro suggested Portugal approach Belgium and South Africa to create an alliance of mutual protection against external threats. Lastly, and one which Salazar would have to focus on for the next 30 years, was for the Portuguese to build up a strong military presence in Angola and Mozambique. During the Sudeten crisis in September of 1938, it was reported that Neville Chamberlain had suggested partitioning Angola in order to appease Hitler, which apparently old Adolf had said no to, not because he didn't want territory, but because he felt Germany had no right to make a claim on that such territory. These rumors caused the smaller colonial powers, like the Dutch, Belgians, Portuguese, and South Africans, to increase diplomatic communications as their stress levels went through the roof, fearing that the British Empire was going to sell them out to the Nazis. Portuguese discussions with South Africa advanced to possible collaboration of defense in Africa, but then suddenly in November 1938, the South African premier, Johannes Herzog, switched gears and refused to state a firm opinion on Germany's potential presence in Africa. Apparently, the very pro-German Minister of Defense for South Africa, Oswald Perov, had told Fonseca that influential English circles, to include a society of Jews, was welcoming the sacrifice of Portuguese territories in Africa to the Germans. By the end of the year, the British had come to their senses, and finally waking up to the imminent threat posed by Hitler, decided to admit fault to the Portuguese and promise to make amends. This led to a drop of discussions around partitioning Africa, and British arms shipments slowly and painstakingly made their way to the Portuguese. Alright, so now back to the main theme of this episode. Portugal and its diplomatic efforts as it became clear that war was coming to Europe. 
So the main thing to remember is that Portugal under Salazar viewed itself in two ways. One, Portugal was charting for itself an independent foreign policy, one which paid respect to its ancient alliance with the British, but was not subservient to the British as had been so for the last century. And two, if you look at a map of Europe, you'll notice Portugal is far off to the left of the map with a large coastline on the Atlantic Ocean. It is not in the heart of Europe, nor is it straddling the Mediterranean. In September 1935, as it was becoming evident that Benito Mussolini was going to invade Ethiopia, a move which would cause Portugal to vote in favor of chastising Italy, despite Salazar's deep admiration of El Duce, Antonio Salazar spoke of Portugal's position in the world, saying, We are, above all, an Atlantic power. The traditional line of our foreign policy, which coincides with the true interests of the Portuguese patria, lies in our not becoming involved in European disorders, but rather in preserving the peninsular friendship and developing the possibilities offered by our strength in the Atlantic. Much of Salazar's efforts in the diplomatic arena supported this statement. In the 1930s, Salazar worked on improving relations with its former colony across the Atlantic, Brazil, which was run by a regime also known as the Estado Novo, with President Vargas running the show. In keeping with improving relations among like-minded regimes, Salazar also set out to build a strong relationship with Benito Mussolini and his national fascist party in Italy. Overall, Portugal and Italy maintained strong relations in the 1930s, but there were instances where Salazar's adoration for Mussolini would cool. One of these instances was in October 1935, when Italy invaded Ethiopia. As a temporary member on the Council of the League of Nations, Portugal reluctantly adopted an attitude which blamed Italy for the war and called for sanctions against the Mussolini regime. Armindo Montero took the lead role in the League of Nations Committee, which was supposed to draw up and then implement the sanctions, despite Salazar opposing Portugal's role within the League itself. Fortunately for the Prime Minister, German troops marched into the Rhineland in March 1936 before the Italian sanctions could be proposed and the League of Nations decided to shift focus and drop the idea of sanctions against Italy. Considering German business interests in Portugal were extremely heavy, Salazar was quite relieved to avoid antagonizing Nazi Germany. We've already covered a few ways that Germany attempted. We already covered a few ways that Germany attempted to bring Salazar's Portugal into the Axis orbit, including generous terms for aircraft and licensed production of the Mauser bolt-action rifle. And there was also visits by German naval vessels, such as that of the German battleship, the Deutschland, in February of 1938. German citizens, and by extension the German Reich, did a lot of business in Lisbon, enough that it played a serious card in Salazar's dealings. Portugal lay too far from Germany to be handled in more direct ways, such as what became of Austria and Czechoslovakia, so other methods were needed. German businessmen and intelligence operatives played a major role in these attempts to coerce the Portuguese. By 1938, the Germans had cut into British trade so much with Portugal that Englishmen had seen a steep reduction in port wine, one of Portugal's most well-known exports. In addition, resources such as tungsten, which is essential for armaments production, was highly sought after by both the British and Germans, but Germany was able to offer better pricing. On other fronts, Germany was able to shift agents from Spain to Portugal, where they were very active in influencing many of the intelligent and highly placed Portuguese in the universities, the press, and the youth movements. While many of these Portuguese found Hitler's methods barbarous at times, they couldn't help but be impressed by the technical prowess, the sense of order, and strength of the German Reich, especially when compared to the backwater pit which Portugal was emerging from. After a rise of concern against the Portuguese occurred in British press in mid-1939, Salazar wrote to Armindo Montero, saying, I cannot avoid the impression that the French, and especially the English, allow themselves to be panicked and give credit to the wildest rumors. In Lisbon, members of the British Embassy and the French Legation are only too ready to spread alarming rumors. One deduces that they do this either to frighten small countries into acting as instruments of their policy, or because they are scared themselves. I believe the latter to be the case. 
England feels particularly the inferiority of her political machine. Everyone can see that the rivalry between the two parties and decadence of British political institutions diminish the power and speed of government decisions. The government, when trying to deal with strong centralized powers, is hampered by childish questions. At the same time, deplorable publicity is given to the deficiencies in her defense organization, as against the image of strength propagated by her enemies. Secondly, England feels her military inferiority because, due to internal political difficulties, She cannot impose obligatory military service, and she cannot step up arms production for fear of disrupting ordinary industrial production. A third cause of the present panic is the difficulty some states have in forming a common anti-aggression policy precisely because they lack confidence in British military power. Thus, they prefer to reach an agreement with Germany and Italy rather than make things harder for themselves by adhering to the Anglo-French bloc. Now, that last part is something we will return to on future episodes on Hungary, Romania, and other countries, which were caught in between Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, and the Allies. Despite the increasing influence and pressure from the Germans, and criticisms leveled against the British, Salazar kept his strategic cool, and from 1936 to 1939, he gave several speeches reaffirming the Anglo-Portuguese alliance. In between these positive speeches, Salazar would stick in notes of concern or observations such as the one listed a moment ago. Another one came around the same time as his note to Montero. After the Munich Agreement failed to satisfy Hitler, as Germany, Poland, Slovakia, and Hungary went on to carve up Czechoslovakia in March of 1939, the British had decided to try and form an anti-German pact with the Soviet Union. However, and largely due to Salazar's criticisms of the British in his note to Montero, this diplomatic effort failed, and eventually the Soviets signed an agreement to carve up Eastern Europe together with the Germans. During those diplomatic efforts by the British, Salazar made it clear that he was vehemently against a British reapproachment with the Bolshevik menace. Through all of the diplomatic chaos in the latter half of the 1930s, Antonio Salazar always maintained an admiration and respect for the British, especially their history, traditions, and resilience. While many in the West were convinced Salazar would turn out to be another lapdog for the Nazi machine, he was more focused on charting the best path forward for his people. Portugal had no reason to enter World War I, and he would make sure that this mistake would not happen again especially understanding the mass destruction that a Second World War would cause. On August 23, 1939, Salazar's diplomatic tap dancing was made a bit easier as the molotov ribbentrop Pact was signed between National Socialist Germany and Soviet Russia. Several days before the war started, Germany had promised to respect Portuguese sovereignty as long as she agreed to maintain neutrality in the event Germany went to war with Great Britain. An article in the New York Times on March 31, 1939, summed up what Salazar had achieved for Portugal in the diplomatic arena, commenting, In the present state of confusion in which Europe finds itself, little Portugal is influencing events more strongly than on any occasion since the epoch of her explorations and her empire. Portugal would continue to play an outsized role in Europe, at least until the Allied victory became crystal clear by 1944. Salazar's worry of the United States coming in to dictate European affairs without grasping the full situation and history of the European peoples would prove to be more of a burden than communism had ever been to Portugal. On September 1, 1939, Germany invaded Poland in order to reclaim Danzig and to exercise its desire for Lebensraum, or living space, for the German people. On September 2, before France and Britain declared war on Germany, Antonio Salazar took to the press, and he declared, Happily, the duties imposed by our alliance with England, which we do not wish to avoid mentioning at such a grave moment, do not force us to abandon in this emergency the condition of neutrality. The very next day, France and the United Kingdom declared war on Germany. World War II in Europe had begun. And that is where this episode will end. Next time, we will wind through the war years 
as Salazar led Portugal through the political minefield of World War diplomacy. His stewardship would prove most beneficial to the Allies, but a growing disagreement with the United States would flare up, and it's an issue that to this day affects the way America portrays Salazar and his government during those years. Until then, this is Green Tea with D-Man.